Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Today, we have a brand new set of great stories for you to enjoy. Sit comfortably. Here we go. Don't want to pay OT? Fine by me. I worked for a company that would never pay over 40 hours. Whatever day you reached 40 hours, you were done for the week. Not a bad policy, honestly. I'd usually work 10 to 12 hour days and have a three or four day weekend. That was all fine until the owner's son stepped in. We'll call him Jay. The nepotism was strong with this one. His parents had coddled him and put him in positions he had nowhere near the experience for. Instead of being humble and asking guys who'd been around a while what was up, he just came in and acted like the hotshot, God's gift to the world. The issue started when he started taking over contracts that involved switching over power from one system to another at large grocery stores. To keep it from getting technical, this mainly involved the store's frontline POS systems, working 40 hours and cutting out when reach no longer worked. Sometimes we'd have to work 10 hours of OT, and then they would say it wasn't approved and wouldn't pay. I tried bringing it up to Jay, but he made comments about how it was because we were screwing around and just wanted to milk the jobs. Truth was, once changeover started, you couldn't stop working until done. The worst thing that could happen was the point-of-sale stations were down come opening. Work would begin at 9 p.m. and sometimes end at 7 or 8 a.m. with almost no breaks or lunch. After doing three changeovers and working OT without getting paid for it, it finally had enough. I talked to Jay and told him that he needs to come out for a night and see what we're up against. He flat out refused. Jay told me to stop pissing and moaning and that the work wasn't that difficult. He said he could do it in half the time I could. That was my breaking point. I devised my plan for later that night. The pre-con meeting started at 8 p.m. Work started at 9 p.m. Removing the wiring and old boxes started right away and was usually done by 11 p.m. 11 p.m. also happened to be the time I'd reach my 40 hours for the week. Jay won't pay me OT? Well, then I can't work. He failed to understand this ain't a hobby. At 11.15, when the demo's done, I packed up my tools and quietly slipped out the door. I turned off my company phone and dropped my van off at the shop. I went home and enjoyed a nice week off before starting my new job. Through the grapevine, I heard the GC started blowing up Jay's phone once he realized I wasn't coming back. Jay showed up and apparently had it all finished by 3 p.m. Unfortunately for Jay, the contract stated any delays on the POS station would incur back charges to the company to pay for lost sales. In the end, I got a new job and a raise. The company had to pay $12,000 in lost revenue to the store. They lost the contract, and Jay got to eat crap for about 12 hours. May not be the best story, but it's mine. And our next story. You want to use my truck wash on your car? I do not feel sorry for what's about to happen here. Concrete mixers are big, ungainly things. Trying to maneuver them around a crowded job site is like trying to play miniature golf with a tennis ball. The biggest problem is, of course, other people. Specifically, other people's cars. Nobody's going to lug 50 pounds of tools any further than they have to, so if there's an open space near where they want to be, they park there. Never mind that it's right next to a sidewalk or directly across from a driveway that a crew is obviously prepping. It only makes things worse when it's done by people who should know better, and done intentionally. So we're pumping the grout walls in the late afternoon, which already has me in a bit of a mood. Grout jobs tend to be very slow. Each cinder block has two cells, and the crew pumps the grout into each of those cells, filling them all the way to the top of the wall. Grout's really just a term for a weak concrete mix that is pumped super wet. It has to be that wet to make it all the way to the bottom of the wall. Otherwise, it sticks to the sides of the cinder blocks or gets caught up on the steel reinforcement. There's a lot of stopping and starting, as well as a lot of moving the pump. It all takes time, during which that concrete starts to go off and stiffen up. Things only get worse on a hot day, and the subs will do everything to get more water in the load. Heroin addicts looking for a fix have nothing on grout pumpers eyeballing your last 20 gallons. As we move to a new street, we find a line of cars parked all along the side of the street we're working on, just far enough apart to take up as much space as possible without leaving enough room to get the pump in there. Turns out it's another concrete crew setting up to do patios. No problem. We're all concrete guys here. They know how it is. We ask them to move. 
that I'm writing this post tells you what their response was. It turns out they're waiting for their own pump and mixer to show up, and they intentionally block the street because they don't want us to be in their way. The crew chief tells us we can wait for them to finish and move on, or we can just work around them. It's pretty obvious he expects us to wait. Waiting is, of course, going to make the concrete go off even more and will rack up standby charges for the customer, but trying to work around their cars is going to mean blocking the street and rolling up the hose every time we move. Normally, the crew just drags and carries it down the sidewalk, but we can't do that with the cars in the way. It'd take much longer, depending on when their pump shows up. It might not even save us any time. Still, Todd the pumper rolls his pump right up next to the lead car and feeds his hose out around it. At the best of times, a concrete pump farts and sputters like a nervous chihuahua, flinging small globs of concrete out the hopper. If the driver isn't paying attention and accidentally lets the concrete level get too low, the pump sucks in air. Feeding a concrete pump air is like feeding a hippopotamus a lestra. Crap's not pretty. And it gets everywhere. We probably end up moving that pump twice as many times as we have to, but it ensures that every single one of those cars gets to spend some quality time next to the hopper. We finish, are done with the job, and are washing out the pump when the crew chief, whose own concrete and pump still haven't shown up yet, storms over to complain about all the concrete splatter on their cars. I point out that we told them we'd be pumping there and asked them to move, but they refused. At this point, he sees that I have a truck wash bucket strapped to my water tank and demands I let him use it to clean off his car. I tell him that is a terrible idea. Smoking lounge on the Hindenburg levels of terrible. The stuff we use is designed to dissolve dried concrete, and it'll probably damage his car. The concrete's fresh enough that he can probably just rinse it off with water. He isn't having it. He tells me to stop lying. If it doesn't damage my truck, it won't hurt his car. Besides, he's done this before and knows what he's doing. Now, keeping a concrete mixer clean is a downright Sisyphean task. No matter how hard you try, shoots overflow, pumps splatter, and plants huff cement powder all over your truck. There are a variety of chemicals used to clean off concrete, and most of the modern mixes are relatively safe for something that can dissolve concrete. Our plants provide a phosphoric acid mix, relatively safe, isn't the same as actually safe, to any drivers that need it, so it's quite common for there to be a bucket of it stashed somewhere on the truck. Of course, part of what makes these chemicals safer also makes them somewhat less effective. That's why some of us will bring our own cleaning products to fortify the company mix. These are not the friendly chemicals that will just leave you with a mild chemical burn. My bucket of fun dips down to the good old days of leaded gasoline, asbestos, and red dye number two. Still, I warned him, and he assured me he knew what he was doing. Besides, he's intentionally being a jackass and expected my sub to pay standby for his convenience. I let him have the bucket. I half expect him to stop when he pulls the lid off. The witch's brew in the bucket smells like Walter White's bathtub. Somehow, the fact that his nose hairs are curling up like a spider in a flame doesn't seem to phase him. Brush goes in the bucket. Brush comes out of the bucket. Brush slams into the hood of his car with a wet slap. I can only watch in mute horror as the man proceeds to not just clean off the concrete, but bathe his entire hood in hydrochloric acid, rubbing it in to get out all those nasty water spots. It's like watching an orphan unwittingly skin his favorite puppy. None of us stick around long enough to see the final result, but it's already apparent that he has scrubbed off the clear coat and is in the process of etching brush marks in the paint. I don't want to be anywhere near him when the hood dries out. I let him keep the bucket. TLDR. Another concrete crew tries to preemptively block us from doing our job so they can do theirs first. We take their suggestion and work around them, splattering all their cars with concrete in the process. The offending crew chief then asks to wash his car with my bucket of hydrochloric acid, and after warning him that it will eat his paint, I let him. And our last story. Want me to answer every call? Sure thing. Enjoy your wait. Background. Part of my job involves taking calls from the public to offer various types of support. This can range from tech support to helping people find services in our county that they need. The team is me and one other person. Between us, we have to cover 7.30 to 19.30, Monday through Friday, and weekends as well. Because of this, and the fact that the company won't invest in call waiting for us, 
we can only take one call at a time. Our voicemail quite clearly states that we're a small team, but if you leave your name and number, we aim to get back to you within five minutes. Normally, people are rather understanding of our situation and are happy to wait for us to call them back. But as the world is full of impatient a-holes, we often get voicemails just criticizing us. Now, this happened today, and I've been wanting to react this way for a long time and finally got the opportunity to. Me is me, a-hole caller is AC. AC, on voicemail. This is bloody ridiculous. I was told to call this number, but what's the effing point in telling people to call if there's nobody to answer the phone? AC calls again. Me. Hello, you're through to company name, OP speaking. How can I help? Oh, so now you answer the phone? What's the point of having a number if you never bloody answer in? Me. Ah, did you leave us a voicemail? I just listened to it, but unfortunately you didn't leave any contact details, so I was unable to return your call. Thanks for calling back. How can I help you? You should answer every call that comes through. Well, unfortunately, there are only two people on my team, including myself, and there tends to be only one of us in at a time. So if I answered every call, I'd end up having to put people on hold, and that really doesn't seem fair. Regardless, though, you're through at the moment, and I'm happy to help you however I can. You can help me by doing your job and answering the phone when it rings. At this point, I'm like, F you, lady. So sod it. I'll comply. Okay. I'm sorry that I've annoyed you. I'll make sure to answer the phone whenever it rings. Now, how can I help? AC starts to describe her problem. Phone rings. Oh, sorry. Phone's ringing. I'll have to place you on hold. AC. Wait. Hold. I then help the person calling, taking my sweet, sweet time, like going above and beyond, just to keep this other bee waiting. Plus, you know, it's nice to help people. I take AC off hold. Thanks for your patience. Now you were saying... How dare you put me on hold? I spec oh, sorry, phone's ringing. I'll have to place you on hold. Hold. You can see where this goes. I think I managed to keep it going for about 15 to 20 minutes before she finally hung up, and I'm in for the next 10 hours. God, I hope she calls back. Hey, guys, thank you all for watching the video, and I'll see you in the next one.